Hey, good evening. It's been September 28th, Yom Teruah, Blessed Feast of Trumpets. It is such an amazing high word. I uh, was given a word from the Lord. He dropped it in my spirit, I believe, yesterday or the day before. And that was this word, Echad. And I remember that I had read it before, but I didn't really understand what it meant. So I was like, I'm just, I actually considered um, naming the title of the article yesterday of that portion, Echad, but I was like, I don't exactly know what it means. So I just shelved it. <laughs> and as I was, li I, as I was listening and uh, reading today, the word popped up again and it really came to life. And not just because the two days of the Feast of Trumpets and tonight is the start of the second day, September 28th to 29th sunset. That is two days uh, becoming as one, just like when two lovers come together, they become as one and the two towers. And as I was just now reading the word, I recall that in Dutch, the word for married people is derived from the word echat and the wife the the name of the wife is actually phonetically almost the same echa so i was like this is not just oneness and but it has a strong tie with the wedding so the word echad becoming as one oneness and strength derived from twisting and binding together and i believe that's the lord's binding ties and he is drawing us with the cords of love and there's another set of cords which is going to come into play because the cords or the bands of orion are going to be touched uh, tonight there is a celestial marker in the heavens um after midnight so it's actually technically almost tomorrow morning 4 44 israel time the cords of orion the bands of orion are going to be at meridian so because the article i wrote uh, previously was becoming like really long <laughs> and like heavy in data it started wobbling and um so that's one of the reasons that i decided to put up a new article or at least the start of a new article so it starts with the word echad oneness and strength derived from twisting and binding together just like the base pillars of our dna and uh, a brother of ours casey from under the stars he did a beautiful study i think last week uh, about the unwinding of the heart which is also a spiral just like our dna is a spiral the trumpet brings forth a spiral sound and uh, i watched the beautiful report from our brother james smith from jerusalem his eyewitness account of the sighting of the new moon it was really really special so we are now in month number seven yom teruah the two days celebrated as one the closing of the time of teshuva of repentance and also known as of course rosh hashanah the head of the year the the start of the civil year under normal conditions but as the subheader over here says not in a jubilee year like we are in right now so the Day of Trumpets is celebrated for two days as one long day, and it has various names. All the names are explained in detail over here, as well as many ties with the rapture. It was the birthday of the Lord in 3 BC by the Gregorian reckoning, September 11th on the Julian calendar. And the day concludes the days of awe, the season of repentance of the Lord being in the field, being very nigh, a time of introspection followed by a divine warning. One of the uh, meanings of the trumpet blast, the loud cry of the shofar. 
and the call of the Lord through his word, the Holy Spirit, and his watchmen, that the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, the spiritual seed of Abraham, Israel, um, by faith, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinners appear? First Peter 4, 17, 18. Joel 2 speaks of the trumpet being blasted. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the, of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. For it is at hand. The day's names and the associations. This is a shorter summation of the article which is linked over here if you would like to get more of the details. The day's names and, asso and associations. Teshuva, repentance, and one of the, the examples is the witness of Jonah to the Ninevites, that started on Elu 1, just like Jesus' days in the wilderness. So Jonah, when he went to Nineveh, he gave a 40-day time frame unto judgment. But in that uh, instance, in that case, Nineveh repented really quickly, but the time frame was 10 days. So this is the start of the final 10 days, just like on a little one, after Jesus was baptized, the Spirit drew him into the wilderness immediately. So this is also the ten final days of Jesus' wilderness experience. The days are known as Rosh Hashanah, or the head of the year, but also as the birthday of the world, or the day of creation. Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, the blowing of the shofar, we can find a reference in John 14, 15. Yom Hadin, the Day of Judgment, uh, a reference in Amos 8, after the new moon. And of course, the window of time until atonement, when the books were closed, and Shemini Atzeret, when the execution of judgment took place. That is something, of course, we have to keep in mind. So the day of Hamalech, the coronation of the Messiah, Yom HaZikaron, the Day of Remembrance or Memorial. The time of Jacob's trouble, that is an association with trumpets as well, the birth pangs of the Messiah. The opening of the gates and doors. Kiddushin or Nesuin, which is the wedding ceremony. And remember that part of the wedding ceremony that is that the bride circles the groom seven times. Just like we are now um, in the month that the moon has passed the sun the seventh time and is now on her way to the altar of redemption. So tonight when the moon is sighted and it's already evening where I am, the moon will actually transition from Virgo into the area of the uh, Libra constellation, not yet within the uh, main asterism borders, but it's actually entering into the uh, astronomical uh, region of Libra, the altar of redemption. So that starts tonight. And remember that the Lord said that we would see our redemption drawing nigh. It is associated the awakening blast also, not just with warning, but also with the awakening of the dead, the resurrection of the dead. The last trump or shofar, the reminder of the story of Abraham and Isaac, Yom HaKesh, or the hidden day. In ancient days, once the Feast of Trumpets was finished, the high priest would go into the temple and hide himself in a chamber for seven days. During this time, he would prepare for the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, when he would go into the Holy of Holies. It is here that he would plead with God for the forgiveness of Israel's sins. If the national sins were forgiven, they would not suffer judgment. We can see the parallels, of course, with the overcoming bride, the secluded wedding week and marriage consummation where the bride and groom are hidden in their chambers and the pending national and individual judgment. And of course, the role of the high priest has now 
been attributed to the Lord, he became our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah's first day. The associations according to the rabbinical understanding, the prayers of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, and Hannah um, being answered, and um, Sarah becoming pregnant with uh, Isaac, Rachel with Joseph, Hannah with the prophet Samuel. And Sarah's story is actually part of the Torah readings on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. And Hannah's story, the Haftra portion. It is considered the sixth day of creation in the same rabbinical tradition where Adam and Eve were created. The first two days are considered as a Sabbath. And if you go into the root wording of this particular uh, verbiage of the Sabbath, it is actually pointing to a sabbaton, and that is associated with the word echad. And as I was studying that in detail, the coming together of the sun and the moon, that sabbath, remember that we studied the lunar sabbaths at first, the astronomical new moon, the, sun, the coming together of the sun and the moon, then the first quarter, then the full moon, then the third quarter. So the phase of the moon, the dark phase, that is actually called Echad. So maybe that is why the Lord dropped that into my spirit, but I didn't know that at the time. So Tishri 1 <clears throat> and Tishri 2 are considered a Sabbath day, a set-apart holy day. It's a holy convocation. And there's also a tie to the days of Noah. The uh, dispatching of the dove from the ark for the third time. When the dove did not return, Noah knew that the waters had completely abated from the earth. On that day, Noah removed the roof of the ark, but he and his family remained on the ark for another 57 days until the 27th of Heshvan. But the departure of the dove, the beloved of the Lord, no longer hidden in the clefts, I believe that is a beautiful sign to us as well. It is also associated with the death of Sarah and the binding of Isaac. These two events are, of course, intertwined. And, of course, the offering of the Lord, he would provide uh, the offering instead of Isaac. It is associated with Joseph being freed from prison in Egypt and then, of course, raised up to the position that the Lord had prepared for him. The harsh slavery of the Jews in Egypt ending, Elijah promising his hostess that she would uh, bear a child. A child is often a sign in scripture of a living testimony, just like the man-child in the Revelation 12 sign can also be understood as having a living testimony of the Lord. And then the example of Gedalia, who made a covenant with uh, an enemy people of the Lord, not according to the will of the Lord. And he was actually betrayed, and the people following him fell into the same trap. So between Tishri 1 and Tishri 3, there's a commemoration and a public day of fasting even on the third day of Tishri. Because of the betrayal and the assassination of Gedaliah and the people who were following him at the time. Zerubbabel brought the first uh, priestly offering to the new altar, Tishri 1. And the offering on the altar is taking center stage in what we're going to see in the heavens in a little bit. And of course, as we mentioned, the walls were finished, Nehemiah's walls, Elul 25. The first watch on the walls was Elul 29th, but on Tishri 1, Nehemiah's wall was dedicated. And Ezra, whom he worked together with, he operating as the priest and the scribe to the people, he read the Torah to the people and made a covenant with them. And the um, uh, information about the priestly courses, which can also pinpoint us to the exact time, can be found over here. And the 
uh, accounts in scripture where the story is found can be found over here in Nehemiah 8, but also in Leviticus 23 and in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 31. And in Deuteronomy 31, we also see the transition and the final, um, uh, the goodbye of Moses and the transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua. And if you decide to read these portions in the scriptures, uh, just like I have, you can see a lot of hidden references to the rapture. So Ezra and Nehemiah took the people to the water gate and they actually gave them the living water of the, of the word. So they taught the people the Torah for two days straight. And the people were so, um, not just understanding, but overwhelmed. They really took to heart what they were being taught, that they actually uh, were very much grieved over what the Lord told them in their hearts through the word. And then they were instructed by Ezra and Nehemiah to rejoice and be glad about um, the event of trumpets. On the second day, uh, as scripture says that they found in the scrolls that they were to in, in they were instructed to make booths the temporary dwellings and that was the first time since Joshua's day so Nehemiah and Ezra will all were all about first the reparation and the restoration of the temple and the temple worship and then Nehemiah came in to physically secure the city but also to create healthy and proper boundaries in people's lives. And the working in tandem of Ezra and Nehemiah is really special to read. Their calling was very different, um, but this is one of the ways you can see that the Lord calls different people in different roles. And if uh, we are attuned to one another and aligned with the Lord, we can actually work together and really strengthen the Lord's work. So the walls of Nehemiah were the emulation of the working of the Holy Spirit in and through the bride. And that was finished again, Elul 25. The 29th was the first watch, the first activation of that finished work. And Tishri 1 was the dedication. Rosh Hashanah's second day uh, starts this evening at sundown, and it is also the commemoration, according to rabbinical understanding, of the heaven and earth being finished, the Shabbat of creation. So, tonight, the moon is under Virgo's feet. The second day of the veiled bride, she enters the altar of redemption. Luke 21, 28, in context. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, a link with Uranus, the coming of the kingdom, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a, in a cloud with power and great glory. And actually, the alignment of the Orion Nebula at 444 tonight is also associated with the door of heaven and the coming of the kingdom. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, the Lord instructs us, and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. The moon will be at perihelion, uh, so sorry, past tense. The moon was at perihelion today, 957, closest to the sun, positioned at Virgo's left knee, the star Kappa for Guinness. We shared that yesterday or the day before yesterday. After sundown, she will pass from Virgo into Libra, the altar of redemption, and so the moon will actually be under Virgo's feet, just like the culmination of the Revelation 12 sign, which implies both her dominion over uh, the moon and exaltation because 
the moon is under Virgo's feet and the virgin is covered in the bridegroom's uh, splendor, clothed with the sun, adorned with the jewels of Venus and Mercury. And, of course, the association with John, Revelation 4.1, the Lord's birth in the Revelation 12 sign, September 2017. Recall that the Lord told us we would see our redemption drawing nigh. The sun aligns with Zaniah and the center of the crater, the constellation crater, which is the cup of indignation in the serpent next to the meteor shower in the serpent. September 28th is also the commemoration of the central blood moon, the supermoon over Jerusalem, 2015, the fourth of the then Tetrad. And they consider a blood moon to be an ominous sign, but to the bride is actually a sign of our blood atonement, of being first brightly lit, then clothed with the Lord's atonement, and then made spotless again. So, the moon at Kappa Virginis, associated with a hollow or the wing, and uh, tonight, for me, it's already in the past, the moon um, is already in the area outside Virgo, actually entering into the area of Libra, the four-cornered altar of redemption. It is now depicted as a set of scales, but biblically, it was the four-cornered altar. We're going to see that a little bit later. So here we go. The moon has entered into the constellation borders of Libra. The commemoration of the supermoon over Jerusalem, 2015, the fourth of the blood moon tetrad. And here we can see that the virgin is clothed with the sun at the star Zaniah, the heart star of Virgo right underneath Venus the Beloved and the groomsman Mercury, which is on its way back on the ecliptic. It will actually uh, remain in Virgo and then go prograde again. But this is why I was referencing the sun as well. So it's not just at the heart of the Virgin, but it is exactly aligned with the cup of indignation crater. The exact position of the moon, the exact position of the sun at the Zenaya heart star, the 144 degree angle. So the sun is actually rounding the corner. And that ties to the prophecy of Yitzhak Gadori. We have shared that earlier this week. And uh, of course, it's also a veiled reference to the 144,000 immortal harvesters of Revelation 14. And we're going to read a portion about the overcomers being promised a new name and a white stone, which is associated with that number 144. Zaniah, of course, is also uh, one of the two main stars in the design of the Washington ground plan, which depicts both the birth and the uh, prospect of the demise of the U.S. The crater, the cup, the divine wrath to be poured out, and the position of the, of the cup is such that when the sun is at meridian, the cup is actually tilting towards being poured forth. You can read all about that over here. The bride at the altar and piercing javelins. At 444, Orion's sword of truth, the uh, nebula in Orion underneath the belt stars is marked. From September 28th sunset to September 29th sunset, the second day of the lunar banquet, a potential time, remember from the account in 1 Samuel 20, of an enemy attack against their own, which was typified by Saul's javelin thrown against his son, Jonathan. If the prophecy of 1 Samuel 20 finds a second fulfilling fulfillment this month, David's yearly sacrifice could actually point to the season of Pentecost being fully come, but also the um, sacrifice is associated with the priestly fire offering, Leviticus 23, 25, which is part of the Feast of Trumpets, um, those two could be directly connected. It may even point forward prophetically to the overcomer's works of faith being tried by fire 
and offer to the Lord as spiritual priests in the order of Melchizedek. So one of the reasons, by the way, that I'm sharing this with you is, of course, to uh, encourage you. Uh, and I hope this is helpful to be grounded in prophetic time. But I also write, uh, and I have that especially on my heart for the people who are, come out, who are coming after us, that if these prophecies actually find fulfillment in this week, that in hindsight, both people who find themselves left behind at the first departure, who are considered foolish, but especially the unsaved, they're going to be able to track back, to track back and see that the Lord uh, warns his people, but also the world of what is to come. And that goes to not just his sovereignty, but also his trustworthiness and his love and dedication that he always forewarns and prepares people for what is ahead. So in the heavens, we can actually see a reflection of this scene, I believe at least, of First Samuel 20. For when the third day crescent moon is at meridian on the 29th, it will actually be at the star which is named Zuban al Kamali or Zuban al Shamali, which means the price that covers in Libra the altar of redemption, and it means that the that there is where the bride price was was paid in full by the Lord. We see the centaur below the altar piercing Victima Lupus, now depicted as a wolf, but we shared before that it's actually a sacrificial lamb, marked by the comma 217 K2 pen stars. After sunset, we can see the moon setting at 726, departing completely at 737, at which time the moon will be on the, on the border of the redemptive altar main asterism so while the moon this evening is entering into the constellation borders um, by the time the moon is at meridian tomorrow it will actually mark that star which says the price that the lord the bride price that the lord has paid for the price has been paid in full and that is what the moon is going to mark out the sun uh, has rounded the 144 degree corner at Virgo's heart star Zaniah by the time, aligning with the cup of indignation in Hira, the constellation crater, or the deacon crater, sorry, flanked by the serpent's sextanted meteor shower, the measurement of the Antichrist. At 444 exactly, Israel time, Orion's nebula, or the sword of truth, underneath the belt stars of Orion, will be at meridian, the high, its highest point in the heavens. We can find references in the scriptures to Orion in Job 38, verse 31, in Amos 5, 8, and it is prophetically associated with the door to the Lord's kingdom, and it's also a celestial clock face, and it approximates the positioning of the gates of old Jerusalem. It is also integrated into the New York City, Manhattan ground plan. And I had actually included a couple of links to underlying studies, and I can see that it's now uh, disappeared from the final version. So if you decide to read the article, I'll make sure that I include the links again. So perhaps this time marker of 444, which is um, also related to the frequency, remember that David's harp um, brought forth a frequency of 444, that the Lord's divining sword will come through the heavenly door and divide between the wise and the foolish virgins. And if not, I believe it's just a beautiful type but one day he will actually uh, be uh, in his appointed time. And I hope that will be uh, tomorrow. In the account of Nehemiah and Ezra at the time of the dedication of the restored wall of Jerusalem, and having made a new covenant with the people on the first day of Tishri, they instructed the people in the law and prepared them to make booths this day. So, the heavens tomorrow 
the moon will be within the four-cornered altar of redemption underneath that star Zuban al kemali which means the redemption price of the lord has been paid in full so we know that he is going to uh, come and pick up his uh, redeemed bride, uh, bride he paid for us and he's going to uh, come and pick up the uh, item which he has paid such a high price for the innocent in christ and the bride of christ so that happens right above the constellation victima or lupus and here we can see already a portion of the centaur piercing the victim so we indeed see piercing javelins and the victim slain underneath the four-cornered altar of redemption the sun aligning with the cup the beloved going for before the sun on the ecliptic in the morning mercury uh, distancing himself from the sun right now becoming a morning star so this is no longer a uh, how do you say that a preparation of the nightly encounter where the where mercury went before the sun to announce to all the brides and the virgins to get up arise go out by faith have your lamps lit have enough oil with you that picture is over the sun is actually on its own way and now that the moon has come together with the sun on the third day of the first sliver she will actually arrive at the altar of redemption and right above that altar of redemption it's just outside the picture over here is corona borealis the northern crown and that is the victory crown promised to overcomers so to me this is just an amazingly beautiful picture the moon will start to disappear tomorrow at 7:26, and the actual setting time when it's disappeared is 7:37. The star denoting that the bride price has been paid in full, Zubin al Shamali or Kamali. And this is the ancient rendition, the biblical rendition of Libra, the sacred altar or the altar of redemption associated with the tribe of Levi. And of course, the Levitical requirements for trumpets, Leviticus 23 23 are on the like the in the forefront of our mind the sun aligning with zania and the cup being tilted to actually be poured out and then at 444 tomorrow morning the um september 29th alignment at that time israel time will be and I was actually looking for, because there was an alignment previously when uh, Venus was rising with the star El Nitak, which is the representation of the bridal Khufu pyramid. And I was like, that is not matching. <laughs> and um, so I was going to 444 because it points to the open door to heaven. And then I saw that the sword of Orion and the Orion Nebula are there. So this is actually the sword of truth hanging on the belt stars of Orion, which is the belt of truth. And the sword is actually the only offensive weapon in our um, spiritual toolkit, so to speak. So the belt holds our complete harness together, but the sword is an offensive weapon because the sword comes out to divide truth from error so that is associated with the open door to the kingdom um, through prophetic revelation but also through the names um, and that is accounted for by the ancient astronomers like um, uh, Aratus, like burlinger and joseph size uh, but also through uh, modern day prophecies for instance is given to uh, ellen white she also refers to um, Orion as the door to heaven and associated with the kingdom of heaven and we can also see that this design has been integrated into the ground plan of both Jerusalem as well as Manhattan New York 
the voice of God coming from a rhyme. So this is one of the most uh, clearly defined constellations in the heavens. And it is uh, especially easy to recognize because of these belt stars. And right underneath is the sword of Orion. And this is a close up of the nebula. The alignment of Orion with the Giza plateau, that is a famous correlation. And this is one of the renditions of a study by Louis Vega that the um, Orion star map is actually. You can make a blueprint over both the city of Jerusalem, but there's also a blueprint correlation with Manhattan, New York. That may have to do with the enemy signaling and the presence of the uh, flagship of the UK, Elizabeth, in the New York Harbor as we speak. So the sun aligning with the bitter cup, the Prophecy given to Byron Searle that Babylon will burn. It's not a new prophecy, but the wording and the words really come to life when he speaks them out. Correlating with Revelation 16, 19. And you can pick up the prophetic word in the article. If the Lord leads us further, September 30th, the commemoration of the Lord's naming and circumcision, the eighth day after his birth, on the Gregorian calendar, September 23rd, inclusive reckoning, meaning starting the count on the first day. The prophetically type, uh, the prophetic type of the circumcision of our own flesh and the overcomers in Christ being given a new name by the Lord. A reference in Isaiah 62.2, Revelation 2.17, 3, 3.12 and 14.1. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. The association of that sword of Orion, the Orion Nebula, is actually with the location where the access point to heaven and the coming kingdom out of heaven is associated with that location in the heavens. Revelation 14.1 And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on, my, on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So there are a lot of associations with that white stone, one of them being the um, award given to uh, athletes um, when they finished their race, that they would be given like a privileged access to a banquet, which is really close to what I believe the biblical meaning is. But having studied the uh, original um, outline of the Giza pyramids and it being encased in two limestones and there are still a couple of these ancient blocks which were so beautifully polished at the time that they were actually shining so bright and they were forming a cross formation over the Giza plateau. The number of stones on the uh, uncapped pyramid, this is the bridal pyramid, the altar and witness in stone, was actually exactly 144,000. So I believe that the white stones uh, the Lord is speaking about could also refer to the covering of the bridal pyramid, just like Nehemiah's wall surrounded the earthly Jerusalem. And uh, if you are uh, so led, you can read more about it in the links over here. 
As the September 30th sun will set, the evening portion of the Sabbath of Repentance will start on the weekly calendar. It's the last Sabbath before Yom Kippur when the Torah readings of Va'yelech are, read, are read. This is Moses' farewell sermon and the commissioning of Joshua to lead the people into the Promised Land. So, next Sabbath, the readings, the Bible readings, are recorded over here. The farewell address of Moses and the commissioning of Joshua and Moses and the Lord strengthening Joshua through Moses and telling him to not be afraid. So we see that scepter change and the transition from the wilderness days to the new, the new leadership of Joshua. He would be lifted up and given new kingly robes. He would have to take up his old robes because he would be introduced by the Lord into the order of Melchizedek. And the Lord would lead him himself in his first conquest of Jericho. September 30th, at the timestamp of the Swedish boy's vision, 7 o'clock in the morning, Stockholm time. The sun is rising in the east, while in the northern direction, the constellation Cygnus, another representation of the Giza Plateau. So, not just the belt stars of Orion, but even a closer match to the Giza Plateau is the constellation Cygnus, and it will actually be planted into the ground at the timestamp, 7 o'clock, Friday, of the Swedish boy's vision. It is planted and flanked by the constellation Lyra. The harp of David is what it's associated with, of course, with the 444 hertz frequency. Hercules is flanking the scene. So we have the Northern Cross, Cygnus, where the Panstar's Comet originated from, which we have tracked all the way, uh, having now arrived in the constellation Hercules. The Harp of David is at the horizon in the north, and Hercules with the comet C202103 Pan Stars, the comet that made the trumpet call to the believers in the Pleiades, and then followed Rebecca's trial through the camel in the heavens, and then uh, touching the tail of Draco, entering into the harvester, and now, after um, being in the Northern Cross constellation, it has now entered the constellation Hercules. And on that same time, stamp seven in the morning, Friday, the southern direction uh, is actually depicting Sirius, the um, hawk star of the constellation, which was biblically a hawk coming down to snatch his own. Now it is a dog known as Canis Major, but it used to be a hawk in, we can still find the traces, not just in the names, but also in the Egyptian Dendera's, uh, Dendera chart. We've done a really extensive study uh, a couple of months ago that this is actually the, not just the brightest star in the firmament, but this is the Revelation 22 bright morning star. So Sirius rises before the sun, and exactly at the timestamp of the Swedish boy's vision, it is at meridian. Two minutes uh, beforehand, actually, to be specific. I think um, when it comes to astronomy, it's really important to be specific. Looking upward from Sirius, we can actually see that the constellation Gemini, the bride and groom with the celestial servigate, is also marked out by the Lord. The asteroid uh, Pallas uh, is actually flanking uh, Sirius, and I haven't studied that asteroid um, at all, <laughs> but it really caught my attention. So the bright morning star being at a meridian at seven o'clock with the palace nearby next to the constellation Orion, which has just been marked, um, not just the belt stars of Orion, but now the sword of Orion. I 
think the Lord is drawing a beautiful picture for us in the heavens. And at the time of the time stamp, the moon will actually enter the constellation Scorpio, the enemy, and is in her overcoming uh, phase because she is under the covering of the restrainer and she will overcome the enemy and then the, not just the heart star of the scorpion but then the stinger stars at the end at the time of the swedish boy's vision she will align with the uh this is like a 90 degree angle from the ecliptic with victima and the piercing of the victim by the centaur uh next to it and um Come to think of it, this is the exact same location where the uh, second Passover, May 16th, um, blood moon and lunar eclipse took place. So that was the marking that the Lord would give us the extension of the second Passover timeline. And we have come a long way since then, right? So... I can actually see that um, the uh, version of a beautiful worship song is not available now through the blog. I'm going to correct that link as well. But I'm going to play it for you through the, um, on the background, I have it ready. I'm just going to play it in the background of the end of this video. So once again, just like Ezra and Nehemiah instructed the people, and this is really close to my heart because when we are considering our own departure and uh, coming to the conclusion that we can no longer reach our loved ones uh, for the Lord in the way we would want to, it's not that our words will return void and everything we witness of and share with them um, but we can be really mournful and sorrowful at this time and uh, touched in our hearts and remember that Ezra and Nehemiah instructed the people to be joyful and glad uh, because of all what the Lord has done for us and to, pro and to proclaim his victory on our behalf and what I see in the scriptures, in the reminders in so many verses, and I think it aligns beautifully with the heavens, is that our Lord is on his way. And I hope it's either today or at the end of this week. And if not, he will lead us forward and we will grow in faith. So to ready yourself spiritually, the bride has made herself ready, but we may still be able to reach out to others, especially the people we think may be left behind after the first departure. So if you click on the link over here in the article at the end, you can find all kinds of materials you can either download and print or put on a digital carrier, which is uh, able to be viewed offline because the internet will most likely not be stable after we leave. So if you haven't done that, it's also very good for your heart to actually write a left behind letter for people. There's a format included to write that letter. It's difficult to do. I've done it a couple of times. And, uh, but it's also a really good way of gaining closure. And, uh, and to surrender to the Lord in to surrender everyone we love into his loving hands. So I'm going to just let the song roll for a little bit and uh, pray a blessing over your night and over your day tomorrow. Much love.
Thank you.